Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. My good friend and colleague Jed Disler at Classics Today recently reviewed Kit Armstrong's debut recording on Deutsche Gramophone, two discs of piano music of William Byrd and John Bull, colleagues in the Elizabethan period. Now that's throwing the gauntlet down for a discographic debut, isn't it? Who knows this music really well, you know, on the piano. I mean, Glenn Gould did a little bit of it. Every so often, somebody does something. But a two-disc, hour, and say 15-minute collection of it, all at one shot, on the piano, in this day of period instrument orthodoxy and propriety, whoa, baby, this is a guy you're going to love. I mean it. Jed thought it was fabulous. And because I always listen to Jed, and you should too, um, I ran out and I grabbed it. I grabbed it immediately. I downloaded it and grabbed it. I have it in two formats. It's fabulous. It's just amazingly great. It really is. I mean, first of all, I love the music of this period. The whole, you know, Armstrong calls it the golden age of English music. In some ways, it really was. I mean, it was the time of Bird and Tallis and John Bull, who was one of the first great composers, almost exclusively, not quite, but exclusively for the keyboard. And in Armstrong's view, these two composers represent the birth of legitimate solo keyboard music, the type of music that you can play on a keyboard instrument in a recital, and it's captivating and fills up the time, and you can just listen to it for itself. It's not a dance necessarily. It's not a song missing its text. It's independent, fabulous keyboard music. And that is exactly how he plays it. And it's just, oh boy, did I have fun with this. I actually was thinking of talking about this disc as part of my road music series because I played it initially in my car driving to Connecticut. And it, because it lasts just about as long as it takes the ride, as the ride takes. And it was fabulous. It works great in your car. The problem is I can't play you samples. If I can't play you samples, because I don't have permission from Deutsche Gramophone because you can't find anyone, it's just it's so annoying. But because I can't play you samples of it, um, I I don't want to you know do the road music thing, the shtick with playing it on the road because it just doesn't make any sense. But boy, it works fabulously. It works fabulously for a couple of reasons. One is because most of the pieces here are in the form of sort of theme and variations type things. So the tunes are absolutely captivating. The variations are fascinating and they have wonderful patterns of elaborate virtuosic things with quieter, you know, more more serene moments and interludes. I mean, they're, they're fantastic as uh, just a pattern of tension and release when you're driving, that works really well. And also because they were written for the virginal and you know, the monster pianos didn't exist, they tend to be somewhat limited in their range. It doesn't mean they don't have a range. I mean, they have range of multiple octaves. You know, they've got highs, they've got lows, but they're not like a piano that's like really, really high and tingly and really, really low and growly. And so you don't lose the frequencies in the road noise. You can hear them all, which is equally wonderful. And I know maybe some people would say, you know, it's just somehow a debasement of the music to use it for such a ridiculous purpose. But let me tell you something. If you got to sit in traffic on I-95 going from New York to Connecticut, you need to be kept alert and awake. And this stuff does it, especially in these performances, which are so, so intelligent, just unbelievably intelligent. In fact, Armstrong wrote his own note here, which everyone does these days, and I, I still think it's kind of a mistake. I mean, I, I really appreciate what he has to say here, but it goes on way too long and unnecessarily, and it starts to get a little bit, you know, you know, that, you know, there, he starts talking about the creation of the universe and civilization, and it gets a little bit much. But he does have, I think, extremely perspicacious remarks here, and let me see if I can find them. Oh, and you get this whole thing about how, you know, they are the, the, at the center of the musical universe of their time. I have no idea what this thing means. I have no idea what the point of it is, but it is colorful and interesting. And, you know, they're trying. They're trying very hard to make this approachable. But there's a really, really smart comment in here. 
Um, oh, here we are. Is it here? Um, yeah, let's see. I think this is it. Yes, there we go. That's it. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, let me just read you this little bit here. I think this is sort of the heart of what he's saying, and it's just really, really smart. Looking back in time, one might call Bird and Bull pioneers in the field of keyboard music. When we think of pioneers, there are those who might cite new lands and those who follow to settle them. Yet I do not see Bird or Bull's place among either of these groups. The lands of keyboard music had been, had been cited and trodden upon by multitudes whose names are not wholly known to us. The musicians behind the uh, codex, blah, blah, you know, 1400. Okay, we don't need to go there. Um, being worthy of special mention, fine. What Bird and Bull created, here's the point, what Bird and Bull created in concert and in discord was a vision of keyboard music that did no less than elevate instrumental music to become, for once, vocal music's equal in refinement, dignity, expressivity, and substance. Instrumental music had not just to be pleasant to listen to and useful to dance to. It became, with birds and bulls keyboard music, the medium par excellence of self-expression, unfettered and uh, unfettered self-expression as composer, as performer, and as a human. So I took on Bird and Bull, not so much as explorers, but rather as the founding fathers of a civilization who drew out and revealed the worth, goodness, and beauty of its expanses. That is a beautiful statement. I kind of wish that Armstrong's comment had been limited just to that, <laughs> and then someone else could say who Bird and Bull were. We kind of know who they were, right? William Bird, they were both Catholic in the Elizabethan period. Bird was quite famous and well-known, although he became a recluse later in his life because of his, his Catholicism, for which he was perpetually penalized, even though everyone respected him as a musician. Bull was a serial adulterer and kind of crazy difficult guy who wound up fleeing England for Antwerp, where he spent uh, the rest of his career. And the two of them had rather different styles, which I think Armstrong um, isolates quite well in grouping these pieces into little groups of bird versus bull, so you can hear the difference. He's also done a whole series of YouTube demonstrations in, in connection with this, with the release of this thing. Um, that you can go and listen to. But I, I have to say, in, in honesty, they're both working within a style, um, a style of the period. That style had its limitations. The instrument itself had its limitations. And so until you get to know the music really well, the two of them can sound quite similar. And I don't think it's terribly helpful to, to say, to say, talking, as Armstrong does, that Bull and Bird were sort of polar opposites expressively, that Bird was more interested in, in the abstraction of musical, of musical expression, whereas Bull was more interested in extravagant emotionalism and, and logical you know, and, and melodic discontinuity and whatnot. I mean, that may be true, but that's true within the context of the style in which they were working. And until you're familiar with that style, you're not gonna hear the differences. I think with that much clarity. And you don't need to. It's just not important because the music's gorgeous. It's thrilling. And, and Armstrong plays it thrillingly. He really does. What he's done is he's grouped these pieces into, into bird sets and bull sets. I mean, I, there's a temptation there. <laughs> you know what it is. I'm not going there. So you've got bird sets and bull sets and and in, in, in little groups. So you can learn to hear the differences yourself with repetition. That's the, the only way to do it. You listen to it over and over and over, and you're going to want to because it is that fabulous. It is that beautiful. And what he has done is given us, for example, there's a piece called Walsingham, which is a tune, um, and both composers wrote variations on it. And these are big works. Really, seriously, big works. Bulls variations on Walsingham are about 13 minutes. Birds about nine minutes, eight, nine minutes. You can compare the two. You can hear how each composer 
treats the tune in his own way. And there are things like that. You know, you've got these variations in the, in the dances, the pavons and galliards. You can hear how each composer's own personal style begins to manifest itself. But the only way to do it is to listen. There is no shortcut. And I think that's a great thing because you are going to want to listen. Believe me, you are truly, truly going to want to listen. And uh, I mean, I just have fallen in love with this disc. I really have. It's definitely one of the great recordings of 2021. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking about it frequently. Uh, go to YouTube, listen to some of the samples or listen to Armstrong talk about it. It's great. And just so you know who Armstrong was, this is kind of fascinating. You know, he was, he was born in Los Angeles um, of mixed, um, I think, British and Taiwanese parentage. I don't know. I mean, there's something on, 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 on Wikipedia about him. He was an unbelievable prodigy. He taught himself to compose when he was five. He went to college when he was nine. He speaks 57 languages. He has 12 doctorates. He's doctorates. You know, he's, he's a musical genius. He's a scientific genius. If you're listening, Mr. Armstrong, do find a cure for multiple sclerosis. That would be very helpful, <laughs> if you don't mind. But, but no, seriously, I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. And now he's in his late 20s, you know, pushing 30. And so, um, you know, I mean, the prodigy days are kind of over. But, but he is, his, his ability, I think, is quite manifest in these things. It's very intimidating. You know, he's a very, very sharp cookie as they say in the business. So uh, he really is amazing. And he bought himself a church in the middle of France so that he has his own private concert hall from which he's made a whole pile of YouTube videos during COVID, just like I did. So I have great sympathy for that. Of course, he can speak and do them in French or in English. And uh, it's, it's all so intimidating. But the music is not, the performance is not, his personality is wholly winning, completely captivating, expressive and direct, and the way he just gets on his piano, sits down and plays the damn music without any concessions to, to hip propriety or whatever, saying very, very wisely, I watch those YouTube videos, he says very, very wisely, I think there is more in the music that it has in common with keyboard music of later eras than it does not. And therefore, there is no problem with playing this music on the piano and using the piano to realize all of the expressive potential which is inherent in the music in a way which is stylistically apt. I mean, why is that so hard for people to figure out these days? It, to deny us the ability to hear Kit Armstrong play this music on the piano would be a crime against civilization. And that is where I'm going to leave it. Do get this disc. I'm telling you, you are going to adore it. And thank you, Jed, for reviewing it for ClassicsToday.com and for being so enthusiastic about it. As usual, you are, you are the guide to end all guides to everything piano and keyboard. And, you know, we critics, just so you know, you know we read criticism, too. We are not we are not hermetically sealed little globules. Well, some are, but I mean, I'm not. I depend on advice from you, from other critics. I mean, we, we all have to listen to opinions beyond our own, and we never stop learning. And the, the, the essence of it all, as I keep saying, is that we must all keep on listening, because when we do, we come across absolute gems like this. And not only is this a fabulous disc, but since Bird and Bull both begin with the letter B followed by an, a, a vowel at the end of the alphabet, filing this isn't going to be a problem. Because <laughs> if you put it under Bull, you'll be near Bird. And if you put it under Bird, you're near Bull. And my Bull is over. Thank you for joining me. Take care. <laughs>